one of the people who's going to help us understand some of the trends we're witnessing right now is Wes Krill. We invite him into the stream right now, and Wes is the Dimensional Fund Advisors Vice President and Senior Researcher. Good to have you here. Um, before we start the endless discussion about interest rates and bond yields, I want to ask you something that people need to be aware of, and it was a deep dive you did into IPOs. You studied 6,000 IPOs, and you found some information that with the what we're witnessing with SPACs and all of this rush to come to market, people should pay attention to. Can you fill us in? Yeah, absolutely. And thanks for having me on this afternoon. Uh, certainly IPOs have been in the news quite a bit. There were quite a few of them in 2020. So we thought it was really useful to go back and look and see what the research has to say about the performance of IPOs. There's been academic studies that show that the first day return for IPOs on average has been about 18%. Uh, which catches attention. But again, to enjoy that first day return, you have to be able to get an allocation uh, from the underwriter during the IPO process. And so absent the ability to access that, the real question we wanted to answer was for investors who are buying these on the secondary market, like all the rest of us, uh, you know, how would they fare over, say, the first year uh, if you were to exclude that first day? And what we found was that a portfolio or a basket of IPOs underperformed the broad market by about 2% per year on average. Um, and of course, we're talking about individual stocks here, small cap stocks at that. So the range of outcomes was vast for this group of stocks. And so again, unless you have the ability to predict which one of these is going to continue to do well, even excluding the first day, it's a good argument for having the broad diversification of the market. And Wes, just building up on what you're saying there, I wonder about enthusiasm for IPOs in 2021. Obviously, we've got this new stimulus plan coming. We expect the U.S. economy to boom. Uh, do you expect a lot of companies are going to really take advantage of this to go public? Well, we see a lot of variation in the IPO activity from year to year. Um, you know, I think it is a good reminder that you know when you do have a lot of variation coming from these small cap stocks, you always want to take a step back and just think about what are my investment principles here. You know, we believe in broad diversification as being a very good risk control, and we also believe in using market prices throughout an investor's process. You know, we can identify stocks with higher expected returns systematically by using their prices combined with company fundamentals. And so for an investor who, and again, I keep going back to what's the relevant question for the investor, for investors that are looking for a good investment opportunity, we feel it's a more sound process to have broad diversification and to use market prices. And you said small cap, so just letting everybody know, I mean, year to date, the Russell 2000's up 18%. I mean, Russell 2000 is running bases well ahead of the S&P 500, the Dow and NASDAQ. But when you talk about IPOs, you know, there's other ways to come to market. For instance, SPACs, it's gonna be a lot of SPAC activity over the next two years. Goldman Sachs just a while ago put out a note saying $700 billion worth of SPAC activity. And Jed, if I'm hearing you correctly, whether it's a traditional IPO or the research we've seen on SPACs, a lot of us regular investors stand to get burned. I think with SPACs, you know, certainly there's a perception based on the amount of attention they've been attracting lately is that they're new. They're really not new. You know, we've had them for a number of years within the marketplace. There are some additional considerations that investors should be aware of when they think about SPACs. You know, from the time that these SPACs actually list on, on the marketplace, they're not right away holding any actual companies. And so there's a period of time in between the listing and when they acquire a company where the data tells us they're sort of trading like cash. So if an investor thinks about what their investment goals are, an allocation to something that's kind of trading like cash is an additional consideration. And then it's not always clear when they're going to ultimately make an acquisition. And it's also not entirely clear what industry might be. There's been examples lately of SPACs that kind of adjusted from the original sector in which they were looking to acquire companies uh, to another sector altogether. Um, but again, I think as an investor, you know, the main implications from our research on IPOs that most investors are probably better served having a broadly diversified portfolio, holding lots of stocks and lots of different sectors. I think that lesson still does apply just as well when you're thinking about SPACs. And to build on what Adam was saying there, you got to be careful when you're investing in these IPOs to not get burned. But I know that you also look at stocks that outperform and that have a lot of value for investors. So talk to me about some of those small cap stocks. 
Yeah, and uh, I think it was a great point just now you know, pointing out the performance of small cap stocks this year. And I'll even add value stocks uh, into that conversation as well. And you know, I don't want to sound like a rooster taking credit for the dawn. I mean, we expect small cap and value stocks to outperform the market every day. The principle behind small cap and value stocks and that style of investing is rooted in paying a low price for expected future cash flows. And the fact that that's related to higher expected returns, you know, that's an evergreen concept. And so we believe that holds true uh, throughout time. I think what this year, and even going back into Q4 of 2020, what it does remind investors is how quickly these premiums associated with a small cap and value stocks can show up. You know, the average return difference between, for example, value stocks versus growth stocks, using data going back to 1926, sure. has been about 0.3% per month. But about one in 20 months, that return difference is over 6%. Um, so these things can show up in large bunches. And if we can't predict when that's going to happen, and the research says no one gets that prediction consistently right, that's a reason why we want to be consistently positioned so that we can capture the returns that these securities have to offer when they do occur.